Hello, I'm Matthew Jarron, Museum Curator at the University of Dundee, and welcome to the latest in the series of films that I've been making talking about various different aspects of our university museum collections. And this is part two of a two-part story of the early years of what we now know as Duncan of Jordanson College of Art and Design. So the story so far, uh, the art school is founded in 1888 as part of Dundee Technical Institute, gradually grows in, in size and in success during the 1890s. And in 1901, the Scottish Education Department uh, designates the Technical Institute as one of four so-called central institutions of art and design in Scotland. And that means that it suddenly is a huge surge in student numbers um, and very quickly they need to find new accommodation. And so in 1910, they moved down to new purpose-built premises in Bell Street uh, as the renamed Dundee Technical College and School of Art. Now, just at the time when the Technical College was preparing to move to Bell Street and planning out their new accommodation, an extraordinary development occurred which nobody was expecting, caused by the death in 1909 of a local businessman, James Duncan of Jordanson. Duncan had made his money in South America, trading in cattle, and had come back to Scotland and purchased the Jordanson estate near Ailith. And when he died, completely out of the blue, he left the residue of his estate, which amounted to some £60,000, to form an independent school of industrial arts in Dundee. Now, nobody knew anything about this. Duncan hadn't previously shown any particular interest in art. He wasn't actively involved in, in the art establishment in Dundee at all. So this was a complete surprise. And of course, because there was already a fairly well-established art school in Dundee in the form of the Technical Institute, it seemed obvious to the Technical Institute trustees that they should get this money and spend it on improving their existing art school. But in his will, Duncan had specified that this new school should be independent of both the Technical College and University College. And so the Duncan trustees were not prepared to hand over the money to the Technical College. And so the result was stalemate. And for the next 20 years, there was kind of various legal wranglings back and forward, and basically the Duncan trustees would not budge. They just weren't prepared to uh, consider handing the money over to the Technical College because it wasn't, as far as they were concerned, an independent art school. So in the meantime, the Dundee School of Art, as it was now called within the Technical College, just had to carry on without uh, the Duncan and Jordanson money um, and did so very successfully. They very much became part of the, the cultural life of Dundee. Uh, there was a Dundee School of Art Club form which organised talks and, and all sorts of other activities and most notably a huge big fancy dress ball that was held every year which ultimately evolved into the revels, the sort of legendary uh, once a year uh, activity in the, in the art college. But with the facilities that they had, and with the level of staffing that they had, there was only so far that they could go in terms of, of what teaching they were able to offer. Now when the, uh, that big redevelopment of art education happened in 1901, the Scottish Education Department instituted a new syllabus uh, for the four Scottish art colleges. And that syllabus was based on a four-year diploma course, the first two years were a kind of general foundation course during which students did a bit of everything. And then in the last two years, they would specialise in either art or design. And while the other three art colleges in Aberdeen, Edinburgh and Glasgow were able to offer a full four year diploma course, Dundee's limited facilities meant that it, for the moment, it could only offer the first two years. But Delgatti Dunn and his new staff were working hard to try to build on, on what they were doing. And finally, in 1914, they got approval from the, the, the SED to be able to teach the full four year d design diploma course. Uh, and the first two students to graduate with this new design diploma uh, were notably both women, Louise Milne and Winifred Heen. Uh, these are textile designs that they both did. Again, these were published in the studio magazine. But it wasn't until 1929, uh, a whole 15 years after they got approval for the design diploma, that the art school was finally able to teach the full four-year diploma in drawing and painting. 
And that was also a significant year because it marked the start of uh, postgraduate study for the first time. They uh, started to award post-diploma years to the best students in each year. And they also started to award travelling scholarships for the first time that year. Now the first person to be awarded both of those things uh, was a design student called Walter Pritchard. Uh, so he became the first to do a post-diploma year in design and also then won a travelling scholarship uh, to go to Italy. And we have this one piece by him uh, that he did. He obviously done this little drawing of uh, a decorative scheme in mosaic at the Church of San Vitale in Ravenna uh, in 1930. And Pritchard actually was one of the most successful graduates from the art school at this time. He went on to a very successful career, uh, both as a stained glass designer, uh, but also as a teacher. He taught stained glass design uh, in Glasgow School of Art for many years. And in fact, most of the other pieces that we have from the, the college collection of, from this time are also uh, from travelling scholarship pieces. So Ian Eady, uh, another very successful student who came back and taught in the art school for many years, uh, was also awarded a travelling scholarship. And we have a series of very beautiful watercolours that he did in Italy, uh, like this one. Um, we have a few other pieces from the 1930s, uh, so for example Alexander Allen, another very successful student who also came back to teach in the college. Uh, we have a few pieces uh, like this by him. John Greensmith was another very successful student, uh, did graphic design and went on to become very successful as a poster designer. We have this fantastic Winnelot poster that he designed in 1938. And then after the war, he then came back to the art college and became head of graphic design for many, many years. And one of the reasons why that sudden development happened of the, the, the drawing and painting diploma and then the postgraduate study and these various things was because of the, the very dynamic new head that took over as principal of the art school from uh, Delgatti Dunn in 1927. This was Francis Cooper after whom the Cooper Gallery at the Art College is named. Um, and Cooper really tried to sort of reinvigorate uh, the art school through various different means. Uh, he brought in a number of new staff. So for example, uh, James McIntosh Patrick uh, came to initially to teach etching. And this is a fantastic uh, painting by Macintosh Patrick of Alec Russell, who was head of design, another really significant figure in the art school at this time. Uh, but various other tutors as well, including Edward Baird, the Montrose artist, uh, notable for being one of the first Scottish artists to really embrace surrealism. Uh, Dudley D. Watkins, the comics legend, was teaching illustration in the art school in the 30s. So an extraordinary mix of different staff. But we also start to see uh, art students get out into the community more. And this is another thing that Francis Cooper was really keen on. He really wanted the art school to be visible. He wanted it to be an essential part of the cultural life of the city. And so, for example, when the new city chambers were being built as part of the city square development in the early 30s, the art school got the commission to create the stained glass designs, which were done by Alec Russell and Walter Pritchard and worked on by various students in the school. One of the other things that Cooper was really keen to do was finally to win the battle of the Duncan and Johnson bequest. It had sat there for 20 years and nobody could agree anything. But in 1929, a new act was passed, the Educational Endowments Act. And that gave Cooper the ammunition that he needed to say, look, we really need to look at this again. And when the Duncan trustees weren't willing to play ball, he went to the town council in Dundee uh, and the Lord Provost, uh, um, held a big public meeting to try to sort this out uh, and when that didn't obviously uh, yield anything uh, they went direct to the educational commissioners themselves and said look here's the situation we need a, we need a resolution and so these endowment commissioners came up to Dundee uh, spent a week reviewing all of the evidence and ultimately concluded that the Duncan trustees needed to hand over the money to the technical institute but on the condition that a separate uh, board of governors would be established for the art school, which would split away onto a separate site and thus would become independent enough to satisfy the Duncan trustees. 
So they looked around for a suitable site. Uh, the Belmont uh, site on Perth Road uh, was up for sale at that time. So they bought this site, they got this lovely old house, which they then promptly demolished. And they held a big nationwide competition to design uh, a building. Uh, so this was the winning design uh, by a Glasgow based artist called James Wallace. And they were all set to start building. And then the Second World War happened and the whole thing was mothballed. So frustratingly, um, nothing then happened during the war. We have a few pieces by students uh, from wartime. So here's a nice view from the roof of, of Bell Street College by Lorraine Bushnell uh, from, I think, 1945. Uh, we have a number of drawings by uh, Jimmy Duff, uh, who later came back to teach at the college including this quite interesting uh, drawing of a, a, a Corporal Pierotti uh, in his, his tin helmet. But then, of course, after the war, there was post-war shortages, the value of the bequest had, had decreased massively, and it wasn't until 1953 that they finally managed to get enough money to actually start building the new art school. So here's the building underway. This is uh, presumably still 1953 because it's only, as you can see, the west wing has been completed uh, so far. Um, they then built the, the north wing and then the east wing. Uh, and by 1955, there, there was enough of it finished that the first students were able to move in. Um, but they didn't actually complete the frontage until 1962. So this is um, Wallace's revised design, you know, very much reflecting changes in architectural fashion. Um, and this was finally uh, completed in 62 and only then were the last students able to move over from Bell Street and finally uh, they were able to satisfy enough of the demands of the Duncan trustees to be able to rename uh, Dundee College of Art as Duncan of Jordanson College of Art. Although of course unofficially it had been known as the Duncan of Jordanson College of Art for many years uh, before that. And so, as I mentioned, from 1955, when they were first moved into that building, uh, they then started the college collection as we know it today, and we still carry that on uh, every year, acquiring things from the annual degree shows. And of course, from there, the college grew and grew until by the end of the 20th century, it had become the largest art college in Scotland. So that's it from me. Hope you found that interesting, and look out for another film coming soon. Bye for now.